Good morning and welcome to the National Press Foundation. I'm Sunny Efren, NPF's president. And I'd like to thank this morning, uh, the Heinrich Foundation, which has sponsored our ongoing series on international trade. We'll be dropping those resources in the chat. We've done previous programs on food and food security and global supply chains that you may find helpful if you're a journalist. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Andrea Durkin, who is the founder of Sparkplug LLC and has written a new paper on Chinese food security and China's new food security strategy for the Heinrich Foundation. Joe Glauber, who is the senior research fellow for the International Food Policy Institute and also former chief economist for the US Department of Agriculture. And Uche Jarrett, who's coming to us from Nebraska. Thank you for getting up early. Uh, Uche is the uh, a fellow at the Clayton Yeider Institute for Food Security, and he'll be talking about developments both in the US Farm Belt, but also how China's food security strategy will be affecting Africa. So thank you so much for joining us, all of you. I'm gonna stop sharing and turn this over to Andrea. Great, thank you so much, Sunny. Thank you to NPF for having me here today. And I wanna thank the Heinrich Foundation, of course, for sponsoring the paper, um, which is posted today to their website. So uh, and the question I think I wanna start with is why are we focused on this now, on this topic? Um, what's prevalent in the news is, of course, we're in a high food price environment. Um, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has a food price index. They track this on a monthly basis. And even though prices were starting to come down last month, we are about 34% higher than last year in terms of um, particularly the, the grains prices. Um, and this is really important. I mean, it, it concerns everybody, but in, in you know, large markets as well and higher income markets, but particularly for countries emerging and in low income markets um, that are more food, tend to be more food import dependent um, and spend a higher percentage of their income on food. This is a, a great concern, particularly as they're trying to recover from COVID. And of course, in the news, what we've been seeing in terms of um, grains prices is that China in particular has made very large volumes of grain purchases, particularly of soybeans and maize. Um, this has a lot to do with the fact that the African swine flu affected their pig herds. Um, so, and that happened right when they had also just released a lot of their um, stockpile of corn reserves. And so they were depleted. And as the pig stocks recovered, they needed to buy a lot of soybeans and corn for animal feed um, as the pig herds were recovering. So this prompted unprecedented imports and fairly large um, swings in the global grain markets. So this also coincided with droughts in the major grain producing countries. So with all of these things happening at the same time in the context of, of COVID, um, the news and you know commodity traders and the um, financial traders that look at commodity prices have been um, tracking this very carefully and it's more, been more in the news. But for China, the reason I wanted to look at this is that China puts all of this in its long-term policy context. And they just, well, they released in February this year and they, as they do on an annual basis, um, a document called policy document number one. So this really sets the tone for policy priorities for the year. And it coincided this year with the launch of the 14th five-year plan. And what was striking about it is that even though food security has featured in previous five-year plans, in previous number one policy documents, it was really elevated as a policy priority this year. Um, so let's, I wanted to write about it, take a look at what they were previewing in terms of the policy um, priorities as it pertained to food security. The bottom line, and we can switch to the next slide, take a look at what, what, what we see featured. The bottom line for China and for every country is that their food availability depends on domestic production, it depends on the size of their stocks, and it depends on international trade. This is true for every country. Um, and China intends to use policy levers to influence all three. The size of its market, and it, it means that China's policy choices have an impact on food security, not only in China, but for the rest of the world. And what I see is, and when I look through the lens um, of, of trade policy, and perhaps my background trade policy, um, I see four key policy levers that I think um, are most important to keep track of. Um, that is 
price supports, um, you know, direct subsidies to farmers, the national stockpiling, um, their push to diversify imports, and also a focus on agricultural technology innovation. And again, we're focused here on grains, wheat, rice, maize, and soybeans. These are the most heavily traded, and this is how Beijing defines food security. They define it as self-sufficiency in these four grains. So more specifically, if you take a look at these four, I think it's pretty clear that China in intends to increase public spending on its price supports and its subsidies. They want to continue to try to stabilize domestic supply and prices through stockpiling. Um, and that means managing central, provincial, and local grain stockpiles. They mention in the number one policy document, diversifying foreign supply. They don't say how they plan to do that. So this is sort of my analysis is that they are doing it in three different ways, at least. One is through trade agreements, through foreign direct um, investment overseas, and through increased control of global distribution, um, which I think is one of the most interesting dynamics right now in um, global grains trade. They also put a very high priority on accelerating innovation and use in domestically of advanced seed technologies, potentially even GM seeds, gen genetically modified seeds. So let's dive deeper into each of these four very briefly, and then we can open it up for questions and discussion. So we can advance the slide here. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here it's just to show that there was um, over the last few years, uh, really particularly last year, a big spike, as you can see in China's imports of corn. Um, soybeans has to go on a completely separate chart because the volumes are so high um, and they've been consistently high the last few years, but hit an all time high here in 2020. Now this isn't to say that there's, um, I mean, China's grain output was very strong in 2020. They reached a record high themselves. So it's not to say that this is, you know, to make up for a particular shortfall per se, um, but it's to demonstrate that China, because of increased demand and because um, they have to grow, try to grow enough to feed people, but also to feed livestock, this is their primary challenge. So they're importing, um, their imports, I think most analysts will tell, you, will tell you that it's mostly driven by the need to feed livestock. Right now, today, um, China can't grow enough corn and soybeans to both feed humans um, and for process, food, processed food um, and also feed livestock. So that's what's driving these very high numbers that we don't really expect to decrease um, in the next few years. So let's move on to um, policy lever number one on the next slide. What I wanna point out here is that China is already the world's biggest spender on farm subsidies. That is something that I think goes maybe unreported or underreported because we're still operating in this 15 to 20 year old mindset when we launched the negotiations in the WTO um, that the EU and the US are the largest subsidizers. But you can see on this chart that China has far surpassed um, all three, Japan, US, and EU, which were historically the largest subsidizers, um, to the point where China is spending almost four times as much as the United States spends. So this is a trend that will continue. Um, the National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC, and the Ministry of Agriculture on an annual basis, this is how they do it, they determine a minimum purchase price, particularly for wheat and for rice. And it's available to growers only in certain provinces. And when domestic prices fall below that, then state-owned enterprises like the China Grain Reserves Corporation will intercede with purchases. Now, this is an imperfect system of incentives, of course, because farmers will grow more of whatever they're getting paid to grow the most, <laughs> whatever they're getting paid to grow. Um, so in order to tamp down the amount that the government is spending on these above market um, purchases, uh, particularly of corn and soybeans, because they were purchasing so much of it, they switched for corn and soybeans to direct payments. So now they're giving still minimum purchase price, you know, guaranteed purchases at a high price of, for wheat and for rice, and then direct payments for corn and soybeans. Now, what does this add up to? It means that China is consistently exceeding its WTO commitments, which are to keep its spending to 8.5% of its production value. Um, and they have consistently exceeded that. The United States actually sued China in the WTO and, and won its case. Um, those proceedings are ongoing. So you might be looking in the news for 
Um, any updates on that? Because the U.S. would like to increase tariffs on 1.3 billion of imports from China, having won this case and asserting that China has not complied. Um, so what this portends is continued spending in this manner, but also China's documents have very clearly indicated that they intend to increase subsidies for inputs um, on fertilizers and fuel, um, seeds, farm machinery, all of that. And also they are tinkering and increasing the amount of support they can provide to farmers through crop insurance programs. So the spending will only continue to grow. So this is tied in with, if we can advance the slide, um, with stockpiling. So as I mentioned, when grain prices fall below the minimum, farmers can sell directly to state-owned enterprises at a minimum price. Those purchases go into temporary reserves. Um, and China tries to use these reserves to buffer or stabilize price, um, the, stock, the level of stocks and the prices. Um, and so they, as they've continuously increased prices offered to farmers, you can see there's a differential between the international price and the domestic price. That incentivizes more imports um, and they, keep buy, they have to keep buying those imports in order to stabilize the domestic price. The overall point here is if you look at the percentage of total stocks in the world of these four grains, China has amassed so much that they're up to about 50% in each of these crops. And I think that's of serious concern when it comes to being able to use global reserves to stabilize global prices um, and to have food availability for other countries. Um, let me move on very quickly to touch on levers three and four, and we can dive, I won't go into too much detail, we can go into that a little bit later. But the third one has to do with diversifying imports. They are clearly, China's clearly doing this unilaterally. They're reducing tariffs um, through trade agreements, not on grains, but on other food um, purchases. They're also, they're gonna continue to retain control through tariff rate quota administration on the grain. So that means they can, if the government is buying the vast majority of grains under the TRQs, that means they can control where they import from. Interestingly enough, the third piece here is Kofco. Kofco um, has bought assets. They, they bought Singapore-based Noble Agri and a Dutch grading company called Nadera, which gave them assets across 26 different countries in the full supply of supply chain activities, production, processing, logistics, et cetera. This gives China an inroads into um, global grains trade in a way that hasn't happened really in <laughs> hundreds in, in you know decades because the grain trade has been dominated um, by the so-called ABCDs of ADM and Bungie, Cargill, and Louis Dreyfus. So this is a really big dynamic happening where China will be able through state-owned enterprise to have big influence on grains distribution globally. The last lever, if we can advance to the last slide here, which is um, has to do with high quality seeds. The government, many officials are interestingly calling seeds now the microchip of agriculture. So they're gonna put a lot of money into accelerating R&D. A lot of the R&D has happened in public institutions. The problem with that is that it's not being commercialized. Um, they, China has 6,400 or so seed companies, too many from their estimation. So they're gonna to look to try to consolidate the industry, pick winners, and subsidize R&D to try to commercialize new seed technologies. Um, they will also continue to acquire assets in terms of seed technologies um, from multinationals as there's been a lot of consolidation um, internationally um, with assets up for grabs during in those consolidations. And interestingly, in these documents, you can see that they are um, for years, so they've been allowing GM imports of food, but they have not allowed for GM seeds to be planted. China doesn't want to have to rely on foreign seeds, so they're going to make a big push um, to come up with GM seeds that are domestic GM seeds and potentially allow planting um, in China of those seeds. So these are very big, that, that would be a very, it would be a sea change, a very big dynamic to look for. Um, I will stop there, Sunny. I know I've, I've spoken over my time, but maybe that's enough fodder for conversation. Well, Andrea, thanks so much for that fantastic overview. Um, if you're joining us belatedly, this is the National Press Foundation. Um, journalists on this call, if you want to raise your hand, you don't have to wait until the end of the program. Please uh, drop your question in the Q&A, or you can raise your Zoom hand if you want to ask a question uh, of the panelists. 
and we will get you unmuted. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Joe Glauber, who is the uh, a fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and former uh, chief economist of the USDA. Joe, before you start, I've got one question for you, overview for you, which is that we've always thought that, you know, whatever China does, the market will adjust because, you know, demand will create uh, supply. But now here we've got plagues, both animal, uh, African swine fever and human. Um, COVID. We've got drought. We've got wildfires. I mean, this seems to be the new normal. Is Are we infinitely, you know, elastic in terms of supply? Is China's new policy going to create, you know, distress in the global ecosystem for food? Uh, I don't think so, uh, is the quick answer. Um, you, you might remember back in the mid-90s when China was buying a lot of food, uh, a little book came out uh, by Lester Brown saying, who will feed China? And with the underlying premise that China was somehow, because of its incredible demand and growth, was going to starve the world. And here we are, you know, almost 25 years later with, you know, uh, essentially uh, meeting those demands. This year is uh, a challenge because of, as Andrea mentioned in her paper, um, which which I think is quite good and, and raises a lot of important issues, but uh, demand has increased because of the, the rebound in the hog uh, population. Um, uh, but, you know, if you look at the long term outlooks projected by OECD and FAO and uh, USDA and others, they suggest that those demand for feed grains will actually decline over the next few years and overall be about at the same level in 10 years as they have been over the last three years, a little bit of growth. Soybeans will increase. Um, they're looking at annual increases of about 1% per year. I mean, that. China doesn't grow soybeans right now for feed consumption. They grow uh, soybeans for food consumption. And so traditionally they've imported their needs, but unlike the last 10, 15 years where imports were growing by 5% per year, we're looking at imports growing by only about 1% per year. So I think, I think the world will supply, there are a lot of challenges out in the world due to climate and other things over the next 20 years, but I don't think China is the, the single driver of that. I think it, there are many, many elements. Okay. Could you talk just a little bit about how you see this impacting um, vulnerable populations around the world in the short term? Um, you know, I think that, that certainly food prices are up, or I should say commodity prices are up. Retail food prices aren't up in a lot of places. The US, for example, we're looking at 1% inflation year over year over the last month in food inflation. So even if you look at it annualized over the last two years, because COVID was special, right? Last year, prices were high uh, because of problems in supermarkets and other places. But we haven't seen much uh, food price inflation at the retail level in the US. Now, if you're a, a wheat importing country in say the Middle East, and you've seen wheat prices go up 30%, uh, and a lot of your diet comes from wheat, those things, unless there are consumer subsidies and other things, which some countries have, uh, they will be more affected uh, directly. And if there's less processing between the farm value and the retail value in a country, you'll see a bigger impact. But right now, um, commodity prices are high. Um, uh, we're still right at the beginning of the, uh, you know, approaching the uh, harvest in the Northern hemisphere. I think uh, right now crops look generally good around the world with the exception of the Northern Plains um, and Canada uh, where we see some, some dryness. But I, I think that we'll see prices moderate over the next few years. Okay, and reality check on another um, hot topic. Um, the buzz that China is quote unquote buying up land in the US farm belt or buying up land in Africa in a way that ought to farmland in a way that ought to alarm the rest of the world, true or false? I'd say false. I think, I, don't get me wrong. I think a land acquisition uh, is, is something that should be paid attention to, but I think it's way overblown when you're talking about a country like the US. We've seen it a little bit, uh, but, but generally foreign ownership in the US uh, for farmland is quite small. Uh, you know, we're talking a couple of percentage uh, percent of, of overall land. Yeah, but don't get me wrong. I mean, I think there are concerns when you've seen of, of, of contracting in, in areas like East Africa and other areas, um, there are land tenure issues and sovereignty issues that, that countries may have uh, uh, concerns over. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much, um, panel, uh, attendees. Feel free to raise your hand or drop a question in the chat. Let me turn this over to you, Uche. What's happening with farmers in the US Farm Belt and what about uh, farmers and other end consumers um, in some of the African countries that you've been following? Sure, uh, thanks, Annie. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just basics in terms of what an increase in Chinese demand means for the suppliers of uh, agricultural products. As the U.S. has now started to loosen up the, the trade war frictions with, with China and more and more of these flows, especially with the phase one deal that was signed and the promise of increased uh, purchases of Chinese goods from the United States, coupled with the higher prices, I think farmers in, in the Midwest are doing quite well. I mean, for this time period where there's an increase in price, and that's just a simple law of supply that suggests that if your prices are good, you produce more and you benefit from that. Uh, but like Joe said, I mean, concerns regarding this idea that China's somehow buying a lot of land in this area and that they're gonna push people out of competition, that's just not what we're seeing. Uh, I think people in the farm belts are doing well. Like you said, nothing to worry about at the moment. Again, we do have concerns with respect to uh, climate change, global warming, all of those things, they've been there before, but they're not really the reason for these price hikes. And I do completely agree with Joe that this is a reaction to what we're just coming out of, the compounding of several different events that just sort of happened at the exact same time. And we respond to negativity in the same way to protect ourselves, to withdraw. So this is part of that, 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 um, that drive to kind of push things back to, to the place where you're at. Everybody kind of has that, that in, in their minds. Uh, turning my attention uh, away from the Midwest a little bit and going to, to the conversation of Africa, because I know that a lot of the conversations about how China could potentially uh, diversify their, their imports is to really go into China, again, going back to what Andrea talked about uh, in her paper, uh, and this whole idea about land acquisition. Now, there are rumors everywhere about the amounts that have been bought, and I came across this really nice book that was written by uh, Deborah Broughtingham. I'm, pretty sure I'm, I'm, I'm getting that wrong, but she basically, uh, the book is titled Will Africa Feed China? Uh, it was written in 2015. I think it's an excellent resource that goes through the process of essentially painstakingly debunking the myths of what China was doing in Africa. Now there were you know, rumors that about 6 million hectares have been purchased by Chinese companies that are currently working in Africa. And she said, look, she looked at everything and it was about only 240,000 hectares. She even has a, a table on their website where she outlines exactly where each of them uh, were, how much they bought and what they were actually using it to do. So I feel like that is completely overblown and not necessarily uh, a big issue. And just thinking about what it means for China to either enter the United States and go buy land in the Midwest or for Africa. I'll leave you with a couple of um, just statistics about what Africa has in terms of uh, their ability to produce. Apparently Africa has about 60% of the world's unused arable land that will be necessary for production in the next few years. But they are not even meeting 25% of their yield capacity. So there's an abundance of resources and a shortage of an ability to take advantage of those resources, which is what is inviting a lot of foreign interests. Now in the past, we would have seen this foreign interest in the form of US, uh, 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 United Kingdom, the European Union, investing in these, Africans, uh, in these African countries. But what we're seeing instead is China taking on that responsibility and doing that. There were also conversations about the type of help that people can get from the West versus China. Now, because China is very people oriented, they have a large uh, amount of labor. Most of what they've developed has been geared towards utilizing labor, not in the same way that people in the West have done. So if you look at the United States agricultural process, it's very capital intensive, very investment heavy. But when you look at the Chinese situation, you're able to really get at the individual which would appeal more to the, to the African continent. So there seems to be uh, a symbiosis there that seems to be working. Now, whether or not this is profitable in the long run, whether or not the deals being made are, are potentially beneficial for both parties, we can't say for right now, we'd have to look at individual deals to see what's going on, but there definitely are some positives uh, uh, in, that, in that respect. Uh, the one thing that I will say uh, that kind of concerns me a little bit is not necessarily the idea of purchasing land. I feel that Africans being one myself, we understand the value of land. We know what it means, we know what it implies, we know that it holds future value. So I'm not too worried that um, we're gonna see a lot of cessation of African land going to 
to foreigners, whether China or any other country. What does concern me a little bit is this idea of contract farming and what kind of deals people sign because of contract farming. Now, contract farming is simply just the idea that um, an investor provides certain resources and then there's an agreed upon price for a particular uh, uh, output. Now, what concerns me is what types of deals that people may actually wind up signing in, in these African countries. Again, because of maybe a lack of exposure or lack of education and not fully understanding what these deals themselves can actually mean and people take, being taken advantage of in the sense that if they sign something that gives, for example, I'm not saying this is the case, but what really worries me is the idea of the right of first refusal where you kind of lock in a particular price and then you have to go to that to that company and then say, okay, this is what we have. What's the price you want to pay for it? If, if it's, if it's uh, X amount, they go ahead and they do that. But again, it removes that competition and the ability for these prices to go up for these farmers to, to actually benefit from what it is you're doing. So that does concern me a little bit. I want to make sure that um, people are doing everything they can to ensure that these contracts are relative. And this is where the institutions and the government should really step in and make sure that these things aren't concerned. So in, in comparing the acquisition of land to contract farming, I'm much more worried uh, about that, that contract farming component. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and see if the floor, if anybody has questions. Okay, well, thanks for that very interesting point about contract farming and the um, asymmetry of information um, in some of these uh, uh, markets. Um, a question from uh, in the chat from Sonia uh, Begaman, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, about Andrea, your comment on seed. Do you think ChemChina's recent announcement about seeking an IPO related to Syngenta Group, their seed company arm, speaks to their investment in creating gen genetically modified seeds in the country? What crops do you anticipate Chinese seed companies will focus on first? Well, so I, I was doing a bit of reading about this, um, the Syngenta acquisition, it was, it obviously made very big news. It was a large acquisition years ago when they did that, I think it was 2016. Um, and it has been, um, it, it has not turned out as they had hoped. Um, and uh, the analysis from, from, you know, the sort of the Wall Street types that look at this is that it, it is because um, two reasons. One, Syngenta, actually, if you look on their website, they have a very interesting statement about protection of intellectual property. And it seems that their most prized intellectual um, property assets remain with, um, with Syngenta, they did not go to ChemChina. Um, however, over the years, because ChemChina is, um, as many state-owned enterprises are, not operate, operating at a loss, they have not continued to invest in agricultural R&D. Um, and um, has really kind of fallen behind. So it, it, the acquisition did not help ChemChina the way it was expected. Um, Sinochem is also losing, losing money um, and they are merging now and they have to shed some assets in order to basically, um, you know, get, get back into financial, you know, into a better financial position. So um, where, how they regroup from there, maybe it come, maybe the investment in, um, seed technology innovation comes from, you know, government funding as well as money from this IPO. Um, but there, unfortunately, it sounds like not building on, you know, assets that were acquired from Syngenta. So um, this is a sample of the consolidation and, um, you know, the government trying to, to invest, picking winners that they can invest in and put money into. I'm not sure what crops they will be targeting um, first. Maybe, maybe Joe and Uche have a better grip on that. Joe Uche, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, a couple of things. Let me, let me just say at, at the beginning, um, you know, this is actually a good thing that China is putting all this money in ag r and I mean, you know, at a time over the last uh, 15 years, we've seen declines in, in real spending that is adjusting for inflation for R&D um, in a lot of countries like the US, like Europe, um, and where we have seen the growth has been at least in public R&D, where we have seen the growth has been in the emerging economies like Brazil and China. And I think actually, thank, thankfully we're seeing it there because we do need extensive investments in agriculture if we're gonna meet world food demand. Um, now, transparent, transparency is a big issue and Andrea I think really hits that very well in this paper. The, the lack of transparency about what China is doing, I think it would be 
um, uh, it, it goes from what they're doing in R&D, what they're doing in terms of how many stocks they have, uh, a whole host of things. I think the world would be served a lot better if we had better transparency. Um, in, in terms of specifically in terms of the crops, I, I would expect that we would be seeing it mainly in, in, in the grains. They aren't big exporters of, of grains. So there aren't quite the concerns that, that say the US would have of say uh, developing and, and marketing say uh, genetically engineered um, wheat or rice varieties. Those, those exist, but they aren't really commercialized much because of consumer reluctance in, in importing countries to, um, to purchase those things. With China, you know, most of it's going for internal consumption. So I can see where we would see those, those sorts of developments. And, and again, overall, I think those are uh, to adopt those, those technologies to increase uh, productivity. Those are all good things. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, I'd like to come back to this issue of um, intellectual property of seeds. Um, one of our earlier programs early, uh, earlier this summer was on um, intellectual China's intellectual property theft and how significant um, it is. Um, could we go back to um, how much of a, an issue is it? I mean, is it a, a threat to US uh, economic growth if genetically modified seeds are stolen. By the way, there was also the case of, um, I believe um, some Chinese nationals were prosecuted for making off with um, seeds in their suitcase, I think, and got stopped at the border. So kudos to customs on that one. But uh, can you talk about how serious a threat you think this is, how the Biden administration ought to go about countering it, or is this overblown? It's hard to say how um, how prevalent it is. It's hard to say. I mean, that's it, that's hard to say. There's context there. However, there have been. You're right. There have been some very high profile prosecutions um, lately, and that have hit the news. And they're they're big. I mean, you're talking about pulling seeds from fields or um, Chinese nationals in in private labs, um, public and private labs, um, taking technology. And you're talking about. Um, uh, data as well in the algorithm. So, you know, Monsanto's Climate Corporation, uh, there was a story about um, a, a former employee downloading the algorithm before um, trying to head back to China. So um, this, you know, there's, the attempts are there um, and we're seeing them and they're, I guess, prevalent enough um, and maybe frequent enough that Christopher Ray, you might remember, remember in recent speeches, the director of the FBI, um, now includes um, theft, uh, intellectual property theft in agriculture in his public speeches and in, in the list of things that the FBI field offices are concerned about. Um, so it's on the FBI's radar, um, which tells you something. Um, and there was also a, a bill, this doesn't you know, necessarily indicate it, but there is a bill recently dropped by um, Senators Hawley and, and Ernst um, um, urging that USDA, that putting money behind an office um, within USDA to track um, intellectual property uh, theft in agriculture. So the economic espionage in, in agriculture is, is a thing um, that needs, that companies need to be very um, conscious of. And as Christopher Ray said, it is, it is a soft target. It is, it is one of the leakiest sectors. Uche, any thoughts about the um, effects of this in other countries other than the United States? I mean, on so, one level, is it a good thing? Sorry to be provocative, <laughs> but is it a good thing for some uh, folks who can't afford genetically modified Sony, seeds? Sony, you read my these? mind. You, you read my <laughs> mind. That, that was exactly what I was thinking about. I'm like, I, I, I do understand that. And it, the bottom line is kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of theft. If you're, if you're, especially for something like seeds, again, not to sound controversial, we could think about these types of seeds as a public good. If we think about them as a public good where it benefits everybody if we had access to them, then maybe them getting out is not the worst thing in the world. But I completely understand that that is a really slippery slope. Um, if we had better coordination, again, this goes back to transparency issues with China. If China was willing to share a little bit more with the United States and the United States was willing to share a little bit more with China and the rest of the world, we may be able to come up with some kind of compromise that would allow this to move around without actually having it be something that is, uh, that is so negative. Um, yes, it, it, and it's, again, you probably, you've seen this, it's not just in agriculture, but here, particularly how it influences, again, with the, with the advancement of, of climate change related issues. 
we're going to need more investment in these areas to kind of develop these seeds that could withstand all these extreme temperatures or volatile weather and things like that. So I, I feel like, yes, it is bad, but there is, this is kind of the, the very definition of the, the silver lining in the very dark cloud. So there is a possibility that something good could potentially come out. I mean, there's a difference between innovation and use Right. So, I mean, you know, companies are the ones that develop seeds that that have return on investment. All right. And this is China's problem. They're innovating plenty in public institutions and getting patents on things. But to commercialize um, often takes the private sector and the incentive of intellectual property protection is what drives innovation. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this, this has been a much bigger issue in the non ag uh, arena, yeah. obviously, and has been the source of a 301 disputes. And I think this is one that I think most everyone is aboard on in terms of China should be taken to task for this, for stealing IP. And um, I think this is something the WTO or should be addressed through the WTO and not unilateral you know, actions, but, but it's an issue. Now, I, as Andrea mentions, a lot of the, the what China has done is try to acquire those technologies through acquisition, and so buying, uh, you know, buying other companies and things like that. And certainly, that's been done a lot here in the U.S. too, uh, in terms of uh, uh, firms uh, or you know companies expanding by buying other companies. It's controversial in its own right uh, because of concentration issues and things like that. But uh, uh, again, on the ag side, most of that, apart from these these cases that we've seen where. Uh, uh, researchers have been caught trying to smuggle out uh, technologies. Most of that has been um, done through acquisition, I think. Can you hear me? I'm having trouble with my mic. Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so uh, a question, a technical question about the seed issue. Are um, genetically modified seeds um, being made to be sterile so that they don't run true? Um, and does this affect in the terms of the seed collection um, practices in countries? Is this something that is desirable? It, it's a controversial issue, obviously. Um, if you look at, at commodities, uh, crops like wheat, you know, we've had a long, long history of public uh, development of public varieties um, that have been, you know, uh, uh, sold or developed in places like CIMIT, the CGR Center for Wheat Development. Um, uh, more recently, though, we have seen private developments for crops that are commercial, uh, you know, that, that seed uh, can be commercialized, things like uh, maize, things like uh, um, soybeans and, and cotton and a few other crops. And those are you know, uh, the, the holders of those patents, it's just, you know, they control a lot of the seed that's developed in the world. Um, they want to get a, a, a returns on those investments and, and um, it's controversial, but, but again, I think this is a, a broader issue than say China per se. And, um, uh, you know, whether or not China and developing its seed varieties, those things, whether or not they'll be publicly available or how they will approach that, I, I don't think we know uh, for sure, uh, largely because they've been less successful thus far in bringing those seeds to market. Thanks so much. Um, changing to um, I, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, the FAO is gonna be holding their summit in, um, in September and they're um, gonna be tracking how well the world is doing on meeting the sustainable development goals. Do you overall think that China's um, push for um, food security and for increasing, including increasing domestic supply is going to help the world achieve these UN um, Millennium and Food Security Goals? You want to go okay. first, Andrew? Uh Okay, Andrew. Oh, That's okay. Uche, Uche un, if we're if it's a game of a, a TV host game, Uche unmuted first. <laughs> no, I was I was just going to say that um, typically, if there is a push, and this is not specific to this particular conversation, if there is a specific drive for something, corners get cut. So if there is an increased demand, a certain sense of immediacy or urgency about something, we're not going to see climate change or sustainable goals being prioritized to kind of fill a particular demand. So maybe in the short run, and this is just 
my speculation here because I don't have the exact uh, uh, activities that everybody's undertaking. But in the short run, while there's still this push for a higher degree of production, we may not see people adhering to the same goals that they're going to, uh, that they should adhere to. But in the long run, I feel that when this increased demand starts to pitter out, we will start to see more attention being paid to that. So I'm, I'm doubtful about meeting those sustainable goals in the short run or carrying out the activities to do so in the short run. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, after several years of declining malnutrition, you know, where, where we really saw some successes over the last 20 years of declining with, with increased incomes around the world, with declining malnutrition, all of a sudden over the last few years, we've seen that plateau and actually start to increase. And of course, with COVID, uh, we saw a, a further increase. So, you know, there, there, there should and needs to be a very big push uh, to increase productivity, to increase, uh, um, uh, to ease trade uh, restrictions, to be able to meet needs uh, for importing countries and, and others and an increase in uh, incomes in those countries. So these are, are big things. China's a part of it, obviously. Uh, they can't do it all, uh, nor would they ex we expect them to do it all. But, but what, what can, I think one thing that wasn't mentioned uh, in Andrea's paper, or, or uh, just briefly, but I think is really important, is the whole idea of export restrictions. In 2007 uh, and eight, when we had uh, price spikes, and in 2010, what unfortunately what you saw is a lot of countries raised, uh, started getting concerned about high prices and put restrictions on exports. China was one of those. And um, they aren't big exporters, but that does have an impact on those countries who, are, who do depend on supplies. That has a snowball effect, which is devastating. I mean, it, you look at the rice markets, people have, have, have likened it to be at a, at a football match or a football game where all of a sudden the people in front of you stand up. Well, you, you have to stand up and the people behind you have to stand up. And if everyone sat down, you'd get a much better view of the game, but no, you know, that's just the, the reaction and the dynamic that happens in these things. And so there's been a conscious effort at the WTO to try to get people to, to, to uh, cease doing uh, dis disrupting exports through uh, trade restrictions and taxes and those sorts of things. Unfortunately, even a little measure like prohibiting export restrictions for humanitarian aid, you would think everyone should be in favor of that. And in fact, the G20 members in 2011 voted, um, uh, agreed to say that they were all against uh, uh, export uh, prohibitions for humanitarian aid. Yet when it came to the WTO, a year, uh, you know, a few months later, some of the same members in the G20 voted against it there or said they wouldn't agree it. I think that's something that could be done at the ministerial, upcoming ministerial um, uh, in Geneva at the end of the year. That would be a great thing is to, to have a prohibition on that. And China could be elite, you know, could, could, could be a very big help by coming forward on that. I have to, I totally agree with Joe. I mean, th this is um, this is the the problem in these discussions is that I think they're very siloed. Um, that the, the the trade piece of it sort of gets a couple of sentences usually in UN statements, and you know it's the same couple of sentences, and they don't really touch it. And the WTO tends to take a very uh, it's a, not a holistic view on food security, right? Very focused on the, um, the original provisions that deal with domestic supports and TRQs and very technical um, policies like this. And so you've got this sort of bifurcation or siloing that is not, I think, helpful to the overall cause um, of, of food security. And, you know, international trade is extremely important in terms of supporting um, dietary diversity, nutrition security, food security, and in, in particular, sort of taking the edge off the highs and lows of price volatility. Um, it tends to go, when you look at global production in the aggregate, when you look at um, the volumes of what's traded, that really helps countries ride out, you know, the sh local regional shocks from drought and other events. Um, and that's really important to allow the markets to function well. They do not function well when you have a lack of transparency and you have, you know, a lot of market intervention. And that's really um, a lot of what I'm trying to point out in the paper too is that, I mean, that's, we're kind of going in the wrong direction on this. If we, you know, if we think that um, opaque 
and increasing um, you know, payments to farmers is, is, is a problem that the China is not fulfilling its commitments. Um, let's, you know, this is China is not the only one, Turkey, India, Brazil, and others are doing exactly the same ratcheting up the, the amount that they're paying, um, you know, year on year and that that has sort of gone um, un, undiscussed. Um, and when it comes to stockpiling, it really does come down to a little, you know, more transparency and information about the quantity and quality of, of what's there would go a long way um, in terms of looking at the global picture um, in terms of stocks that support food security. So a lot of this really comes down to um, transparency and communication and, you know, better cooperation. And China's doing a lot to support capacity building and development in other countries, but you really have to have both of these pieces. Um, so I agree, I think, you know, reinvigorating some discussions in the WTO that go beyond what we've, what India has just has defined as food security thus far would be very beneficial. Hello, yes, this is uh, Jeff Hertrick, NPF. Uh, Sonny's having uh, some uh, computer issues. Um, if we could uh, continue the conversation and to um, either one of the panelists, could you elaborate any more on the, the, the demand for agricultural products and how China's increased demand has affected the, the, the exports from other countries besides the United States? Uh, sure, I can, I can, I can take this. Um, part of the growing demand in China has to do with increased levels of income. Now we've, we've seen Chinese income steadily rising. We're seeing the build out of a really robust middle class. And I don't have to tell anybody here that China has a very sizable population. And with that growth, with that increase in income has come um, a, a need or an increase in the consumption of meat. Now, if you think about grains and what it takes to sort of feed, and I had, I had a couple of numbers here, it takes two kilograms of grain to get one kilogram of chicken, four kilograms to get one kilogram of pork, and seven kilograms for one kilogram of beef. So this kind of highlights that with more people eating more and more protein, they need more and more in terms of grains to kind of feed. So it drives that demand as well. So a lot of what we're seeing is also a respond to these rising incomes as a, a function of, of China's steady growth. Uh, so their entry into all these other uh, regions, especially in Africa, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, all of these things are being done to facilitate the smooth movement of all these agricultural products across the globe so that they are not in any kind of uh, potential danger. And just talking about the amounts that China generally tends to import, they seem massive. But when you put that in the context of the population that they have, you start to see why some of these may potentially be necessary. I mean, they have about 1.4 billion people. The United States has only 300 million. So all of these things in context would try to kind of explain why these higher levels of, of uh, demand are are generally uh, uh, coming from, from, from China. And how it affects everybody else, again, like I said, with the African perspective and China's influence in Africa, like I've already talked about how the Chinese approach is better suited for the African continent. We're hoping that the positivity, the, the, the complementarity that lives in, in that association between China and Africa stimulates production and development in Africa and then meets the needs of China, again, going farther to address the food security issues. Again, remember I said 60% of unused arable land, but only less than 25% of yield. There is a gap to be made up. If Africa can generate production of more of those goods, we should be able to see much more flows uh, across the board. Yeah, I think in that sense, the import diversification could really benefit growers in Africa um, of grains growers, horticultural, all of that. Um, I think the biggest issue is, is sanitary and phytosanitary um, barriers potentially. And you see, you know, in the US-China phase one deal, really a, a big part of that text was devoted to trying to resolve longstanding barriers to import that have to do with, with standards. Um, and so that, that may become, you know, something to focus on if we're going to really increase successfully exports from sub-Saharan Africa to, to China. Yeah, I, I would echo what Andrew just said. And, and, and interestingly, I think for all the focus on phase one in terms of the export targets, which was 
really all, all the press sort of focused that, oh, we're going to increase uh, ag exports to China to $40 billion or whatever. The real meat of that agreement, the real interesting things are in chapter three, the provisions, the ag provisions, which deal with the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of approvals and, and uh, uh, solving a lot of the uh, little trade irritants that had been existing with China for the last 20 years. Um, I will say that, that, you know, China, I think the one clear thing here, not surprising, because I think you could say the same about the U.S., is, but China is going to act in its own self-interest. And so they're going to import what they need. And I think they were pretty clear in phase one even that, oh, yeah, we, we've agreed to $40 billion, but we're not going to buy just because we're going to just to, uh, we're going to buy because we need to buy. And um, what what in, I think one of the, the stark realities uh, about you know the last four years is if you look at the trade wars that China has been involved with, some of those have been quite disruptive. I mean, the uh, certainly the one with the U.S. on um, you know we soybeans they import sixty five to seventy percent of the world's exports. I mean that's an incredible number. They are the market in soybeans. Where do they buy from? They buy from the U.S. in uh, uh, during six months out of the year, and then they turn to the Southern Hemisphere and buy primarily from Brazil, but also Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay during the other six months. And if all of a sudden you take that Northern Hemisphere, essentially the U.S., and say, okay, we're going to put tariffs on that, we have to buy from, you know, we have to go to our other buyer. And so with soybeans, there's far less diversification. There, there's good temporal dis, uh diversification in the sense you get Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere, which is quite beneficial. But um, they have a similar trade dispute right now with Australia over barley, which has actually helped US corn producers because all of a sudden, if you're not uh, importing barley, you have to get feed grains, those feed grains from somewhere else. And so they've been buying corn from, from the US and corn from the Ukraine. Um, but these trade wars are, are so disruptive in the sense of they cut off supplies from one area. It means that, that you know, Australia now has to sell barley into other markets. Um, you know, the U.S. had to sell soybeans into other markets, disrupting other players. So it has ripple effects, effects throughout the economy. And I think that's why particularly unilateral actions are just so damaging when you, you talk about putting on tariffs, um, they say, okay, we're we're going to show China. We're going to we're going to raise tariffs on steel and aluminum, or we're going to raise it because of intellectual property uh, across a broad range of things. Far better to take those disputes to the WTO, uh, where there's a system, where there's a, a process in place, and and uh, to try to get those things rather than getting these trade wars ratcheting up um, um, uh, that where where they actually end up spilling over into other markets. Yeah. Wow. However, as you know, Joe, the Boeing dispute and others, right? I mean, when when you when countries win disputes and on anything, it doesn't matter whether it's agriculture related, they get the opportunity. I mean, if the WTO approves it, to retaliate, and there's a number that's put on that in terms of of amount of of imports that you can raise tariffs on, and agricultural products are always in the mix because they're politically sensitive and they you know calculus is. It'll cause governments to remedy the measure um, because they don't want to suffer the pain of, you know, increased tariffs on, on food imports. Um, and so agriculture is caught up in trade disputes all the time, whether it's agriculture focused or not. Um, and I, I would love, it's a wild idea, but I would love to see WTO members agree to take it off the table <laughs> in disputes where agriculture is not directly involved because it's really... Um, it's really harmful. Uh, it's, it's, I know it opens the floodgates to other commodities, other products where they would say, let's take, uh, we, you know, we're valuable too, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. That might be true, but, um, but it's unfortunate that agricultural products get caught up in any trade dispute. It's just, Thanks it's so just, much. I, oh, go ahead. No, I was, I was just, just saying, raise your hands if you have questions, <laughs> folks, um, and over to you, okay. <laughs> No, I was just going to do a, a shameless plug for the United Institute Trade Matters podcast. Um, the conversation that we just had just now talks really about some of the really little things about trade that we don't really think about. Because 
sanitary and phytosanitary procedures. Not many people think about that when you start thinking about global uh, trade deals across the world, but those things really matter. And I think Jill O'Donnell, who's the director of the, the Ida Institute, does a really good job of you know, interviewing people that can speak to some of these uh, issues that are not necessarily covered as widely. So if anybody's interested in some of that conversation, I think it's a really good resource. I have my students listen to it all the time. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good to kind of get, get that background. So uh, Uche, let me start with you then. Um, this is the National Press Foundation. So what issues uh, do you think that reporters, um, international trade reporters ought to be writing about, ought to be focusing on? What headlines do you wanna see over the next uh, three to six months that you're not seeing now? So that's, that's a really interesting question. I mean, th there are a lot of things I, I would like to see people writing about. I, I feel like uh, a lot of times when people ask me questions, they're very basic questions, not really even questions that I feel like I, my students can answer or people who have taken. So I think there's a lack of just general information uh, out there. And, and I, I want to see when people write stuff, they really cover some of these things. You're talking about an issue, but let's understand why that issue is important. Let's talk about what some of the restrictions are, what some of the things that you're allowed to do. And the most important thing that I tend not to get when I, when I you know, read um, articles you never see things from both sides. There's usually just a particular point of view that you, that you look at and it doesn't really tell you the whole story. The reason why there's conflict is because somebody else is seeing something in a different way. So I would like to see both those arguments and then let's have the reader make up their minds for themselves. So that, that's part of what, what I would like to see. As for specific headlines, I mean, anything that informs anybody about anything, I know that's broad and not specific at all, but that is really what I would like to see because I want to learn to. Okay. Cho? Yeah, no, I, I uh, look, I, I, for, for a lot of years, I've, I've had a, a lot of contact with the press in terms of, you know, doing press conferences and talking to reporters about uh, food issues. And, you know, they're complicated. I mean, the, 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 the issues we're dealing with are very complicated. I mean, I, I, I cringe almost every time I see the FAO food price index come out because, it's not food prices. These are commodity prices. And so, you know, getting down to the, what food actually costs, people are, will call and say, well, how come inf you're saying food inflation is only 1%, but the FAO is saying you know, it's up 30%. And it's the, you know, trying to understand that, that relationship between uh, farm prices and food prices is complicated. And, you know, uh, some of the reporters are quite good about getting it and really delving in and talking about it. But unfortunately, what, what you often get is that the headline comes out that the, a big thing like FAO food price is up 30%. And then all of a sudden, someone sends a, uh, you know, a national newspaper or whoever will send a reporter who doesn't deal with agriculture because agriculture is normally a pretty sleepy beat. But on this one, it all of a sudden is big. So there, you know, you, you, there's a lot of time in trying to, to explain that. And, and again, these are complicated issues and they're very hard to get across in 750 words or a thousand words in a story. And I think that's, that's we experts could do a lot better job, I think, of trying to explain things to, to uh, uh, reporters. Uh, but, but to me, what I would really like to see more uh, coverage of is climate and agriculture. I think, and the impacts on food security. I think those are really huge issues. They're not going away. Thankfully, it seems like more and more people here in the US at least, uh, in terms of in the ag community are, understand that climate's a big issue and, and hopefully we'll begin to see some things there. But I think that, you know, uh, those are big issues and they, uh, I, I'm always happy to see stories on that, even if I might disagree with some of the things that, uh, that are said in those articles, uh, just, but the coverage is great. And as a former reporter who benefited from Joe's tutorials for many years, thank you. Feel free to call me <laughs> great source. That's my uh, public Yeah, service. I know. I, that goes without <laughs> saying it. Thank you. I'm not sure. I think I convolute a lot of things. So, <gasps> Andrea, any last uh, advice for journalists? What are, we mi what are journalists missing? Um, how do journalists get on page one with this story? Oh my gosh, I don't, I'm the wrong person to ask about that because I'm always focused on the big picture long run and <laughs> I, I would like to see reporters sort of, you know, beyond reporting on, for example, updates in the WTO on, you know, US won this case, uh, you know, whatever it is, what is the larger picture there? 
um, if the US can't enforce its winnings, that is a big problem for the WTO and it is a big problem for long-term, you know, more discussions and, and on liberalization of trade and agriculture. Um, it cannot happen if we can't get past, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to put it in that context. And um, otherwise the case is it's in and of itself is kind of meaningless. So I, I think just make an effort to, to really look at what the implications are of each of these developments um, for the bigger picture for the rules-based trading system and you know, to safeguard free trade and agriculture. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Um, this program is recorded. We'll have it up on our website soon. Um, three fantastic sources. Um, going forward. Andrea, congratulations on your paper. And that's it from the National Press Foundation. Thank you all so much.